Luke 17 verse 20 says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. There's something of what God wants to do within us that is revealed on the outside. May he be gracious to us. May he bless us. May he do something on the inside of us that makes something visible on the outside of us. Every time Jesus uh, would heal someone or uh, uh, there would be a, you know, a blind eye opened or someone would be raised from the dead, what would, what would be said? The kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of God has come near you. His kingdom and the way, his, the way his world operates, the way his economy operates, is different to the way this world and this economy operates. And so when you and I tap into his kingdom, then what ends up happening is that his kingdom comes near those around us. As we do life with people, his kingdom comes. When someone gets healed, it's his kingdom that comes. His kingdom that is within us, his kingdom is now at hand. His kingdom is near. We see the effects of his kingdom on the lives of people around us. We see the effects of his kingdom in, on, 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 on our bank accounts, in our health, in our relationships, in our connections with people, in the, in the open doors for the gospel. We see his kingdom around us, near us, as it comes out from within us. Does that make sense? How, how is his kingdom within us? It's all, it's all a matter of, it's all an issue of lordship. You see, where there, where there is a kingdom, there has to be a king. And so if there is a, there, where there is a king, that, where that king, where that king's realm is, where that king is, has influence, that is that king's kingdom. And so if his kingdom is within you and within me, it's because he is lord in your life and in my life. And that is really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives generally and specifically in our finances. Is he lord of our finances? You know, I, I remember hearing Rory Dye say years ago, he said when people would get baptized, they would take out their, they take out their car keys, their wallet, and they take off their watch. And now you could probably say cell phone as well. And they put it all on the side and they end up getting baptized and they get baptized. And uh, of course, this isn't what really happens because you don't really want your watch to get full of water in your cell phone. But it's almost like this picture of, yeah, God, you can have all of me, but you can't touch my time. You can't touch my possessions. And you can't touch my money. And so maybe for some of us, we do need to take our wallets, our cell phones, our car keys, and stick them all under water and baptize them as a prophetic action of, okay, God, I, actually, it's all yours. My possessions is, are yours. My time is yours. You can't be too busy because your time belongs to Jesus. Oh, I'm so busy at the moment. Well, your time belongs to Jesus. Being too busy is a lordship issue. I'll leave that to linger. So his kingdom is within us. If he is a lord on the inside, his kingdom is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy. Where he is lord, where he rules and he reigns, where he rules, there is righteousness, there is peace, and there is joy. And that, that is going on on the inside of us needs to, needs to come out onto the outside of us. Remember last week, I ended by speaking about the prosperous soul, where John says to the people, to the, the people he was writing to, he says, may you, be, may you prosper and be in health, even as your souls prosper. May you prosper and be in health, even as your souls prosper. So the, our external prosperity and our external health is determined by our internal prosperity of soul. And the first step to an internal prosperity of soul is allowing him to be Lord. Allowing his kingdom to come. His kingdom of righteousness. His kingdom of peace. His kingdom of joy. Am I making sense? So what's my point? The point is that all the issues of the kingdom, all the issues that you and I go through in life, all the issues of our hearts and our lives are issues of lordship. Is he Lord or is he not? Is he in charge or is he not? When you're having a, a squabble, a disagreement with your husband or your wife, anyone here, does it happen from time to time? Do you want to see if I'm normal? Okay. And as the guys all know, the guys are mostly wrong. <laughs> but here's the thing. Even if you're right, you can still be wrong because you can be so on your high horse about being right that you're still wrong. In the way in which you're handling something. And that's, that's the point. If he is Lord of our relationship. See, no marriage is going to work unless he is Lord of that 
that, that marriage. Marriage can kind of, you can kind of do marriage. And yes, there are people who don't follow Jesus who can have good marriages. But there's still a whole lot that they're not tapping into that is only available if Jesus is Lord of that marriage. If there is someone higher than yourself or your spouse to answer to. Then what happens is when you're in a disagreement and we, you all know that feeling of pride where you know you're right and you don't want to back down. Anyone know that feeling? Okay. <laughs> Someone said amen. We just say aina, not amen for that. Okay. We just say aina. Okay. In that moment, there is a moment there where, we go, where if he is Lord, there is a moment even in the midst of all that emotional that I recognize he's Lord of my life. And so I better back down in my context, because this is his daughter now. I've, I've got to change the way I speak. I've got to change what it is, how I'm operating, how I'm handling this right now, because he is Lord. You see, where he is Lord of the areas of our lives, things start to look different. It looks different to what, how the world would do it. Amen? All the issues of life, really, are issues of lordship. And when we're talking about finances, we're talking about stewarding our finances as well. We're talking about living in the abundance of God. May he be gracious to us. May he bless us. May his face shine upon us. Abundance is linked to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's one thing you could write down if you want to write down today. Abundance is linked to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Letting him be Lord means accepting what he says about my life over what I think about my life. Bill Johnson said years ago, and it's been a statement that stuck with me for years and years and years, that I can't afford to have a thought about me. I can't afford to have a thought in my head about me that he doesn't have about me. I can't afford to have a thought about me that he doesn't have about me. You see, the enemy keeps coming and he wants to sow lies into your and my life. He wants to speak to our identity, speak to our lives, speak to us, tell us whatever it is that he wants to tell us that's less than, than God's perfect plan and perfect will for your life and my life. And it's so easy to step into thinking the way the enemy wants us to think. But we can't afford to step into that place. We have to be a people who keep coming back, who keep renewing our minds, keep coming back to the place of what does he say? What does the Father say? What does the Father say? And then start to live according to what he says. Remember I told you when I was in standard two, giving away my age there, standard two. Standard two, do you hear that? Standard two. Ethan was like, what is that? I have no idea what standard two is. Standard two, um, go away. There you go. Um, and we had to write down in our books about the renewing of the mind. It's believing what God says above what I think. So I was quite young in Standard 2, and it's I'm a few decades on in my life, and I'm still learning that. Believe what God says above what I think. And I think in two or three decades' time, when all of us are a little bit older, a little bit more handsome, a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more of the glory of God in our lives, we'll still be learning to believe, to, to take what God says above what we think and let that affect what's going on on the inside of us because it's a lordship issue. I've got to, something's got to happen on the inside before something can change on the outside. See, it's not about, it's not about us going, I just, if I could just get a better job, if I could just get a little bit more money in my bank account, if this time when I give the lotter ticket in, I just happen to win it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in, in the same way as if I could just have a better husband or just have a better wife or just have better kids or just have a better school or just have a better job or better business or live in a better country. Ooh. If I could just go to where the grass is greener on the other side. If I could just have all of that, then, well, then I'm going to see, I'm going to see the breakthrough that I need. I'm going to see God, like, I'm going to see what it is that God's got for me. No, it's not about any of those things. You know, here's the thing. It's the challenges that you and I face, that you face today, in maybe in your lack of finances in, in, in your life right now, whatever it might look like for you, maybe the job that you're in, and it's not a, not, not a pleasant job. If you don't deal with what's going on on the inside, you will just take what's going on, on the inside into the next job. I've heard person after person say, uh, it's happened, let's say this, it's happened many times with many people in, in, in their situations where they'll go from this job to that job, that job to that job, and it's like the same problem follows them. The same thing. 
they, they, they'll come to me and say, I'm so excited. I got a new job. And I'm like, I'm so excited with you. You got a new job. Woo, let's do this. We're praying for jobs and better jobs. And then a few months down the line in that job, you know, this is going wrong. That's going wrong. You know, my boss doesn't understand me. Because the problem is wherever you and I go, there we are again. And so you could have a hundred rand in your bank account, zero. You could have zero in your bank account. And you could have 10,000 rand in your bank account. You could have 100,000 rand in your bank account. All it does is it multiplies whatever the thing is that's going on on the inside of you in that moment. That which we are facing at zero will just be multiplied to what we're facing if there's a million in our account. Some of us in this room today can't handle a million rand in our bank accounts. You wouldn't be able to handle it because you haven't allowed Jesus to be Lord in that area. There's got to be something that he does on the inside of us so that when that comes, he, when he entrusts us with that money, that we can handle it to advance the kingdom. We can handle it in the way that he intended us to handle it. Throughout scripture, and we're not going to those verses today, but to be faithful with little leads to be faithful with much. Are you following me? And give you one talent, make, make it more. Don't bury the talent, make it more. Multiply it. You've got to be faithful with what he's given us now. So all of us right now, in whatever place we find ourselves in in life, in lack or abundance, wherever you're at, I want to say for those of you who are living in abundance, he has more. There's more abundance. The five talents became ten talents, and the, the, the master said to the one with ten talents, I'm going to give you ten cities. Faithfulness leads to greater responsibility. So if you're walking in abundance because of your faithfulness, because of decisions you've made, because of what you've, the way you've honored the Lord in areas of your life, and there's abundance in your life in that area, there is more. Don't settle there. I think sometimes the, the hardest thing is to still trust Him even in, in the midst of abundance. In the midst of lack, people are like, oh, we've got to pray, we've got to pray. I'm like, oh, it came to that? It got that bad that we actually had to pray? Fancy that. <laughs> Jesus said pray. He didn't say pray when it's bad. He said pray. Pray. Where it's good, bad, the ugly, when you're on the mountaintop or in the valley, as Nadia was saying earlier, you pray. We pray. That is who we are. It's, we are a people who pray. And so we find ourselves, wherever we find ourselves, every single one of us in this room today, wherever we find ourselves in abundance, or in lack, whatever place you're in, the things that he wants to do in us is not determined by your bank account. It's not determined by your job. It's not determined by the person you chose to marry. You stuck with that person. Isn't that a good thing? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm so grateful. I'm stuck. If, if you're married to the person. If, <laughs> if you're married to the person next to you, say, I'm so grateful I'm stuck with you. <laughs> And if you want to be the married to the person next to you, then say, I'd like to get stuck with you. Am I allowed to say that? Look at the young people over there. Any young person, you want to get married one day? Anyone want to get married one day? You want to get married? We just speak amazing husbands and wives for every single one of you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amazing husbands and wives. Follow Jesus. It's a good thing. Talking about lordship, talking about abundance. If we are struggling, if we're not hearing his, vo his, his words over our lives, if we're struggling maybe to accept his forgiveness in an area of our life, in some part of our lives, we're struggling to ex for accept his forgiveness. And that happens. We're like, because of something we've done, something we've gone through, something that happened in the past, I'm just struggling in this area. And I don't feel like, like, like I'm really receiving God's forgiveness in that area. If that happens, what will start to happen? Because everything on the outside is affected by what is on the inside. What will start to happen is maybe you'll start to struggle with sickness. You'll start to struggle with um, emotional turmoil. You'll struggle with lack of confidence. There, there'll be different things that take place that stem from my inability to accept the forgiveness of God in my life. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again where someone accepts God's forgiveness and actually recognize, I am forgiven. I am who he says I am. I actually am. When he looks at me, he sees me as righteous, holy, set apart. Then what starts to happen is I begin to live that way. See, I can't afford to have a thought about me that he doesn't have about me. Amen? We need to embrace what he says. Embrace what he declares. Embrace his words, and that, that will affect our life and the way in which we live and the way in which we handle those around us. Simple, right? Harder said, easier said. Easier, harder done than said. Right? But the amazing thing is, even though it's not easy, he gives us the ability to step into that.
And I really want to encourage us today. If there's an area in your life where you know I've, I'm, I'm really struggling to accept what he says about me in this area. And that could be, that could be you need to go and apologize to that person. That's what he's saying to you about that thing in that, that area of your life. Or it could be, I've set you free from that thing. You can walk away from it. I've set you free. You do not have to stay in that prison. The door is wide open. You can walk away from it. Whatever it may be, I really want to encourage you today that there will be something that will click in your heart and in my, my heart and we'll walk away from that thing and that lordship in that area will be settled. Amen? The Lord be gracious to us, that his faith, face shine upon us, that the earth, that the world may know him, that the world, that the nations may know who he is. There is an abundance that he wants to bring into your life and into my life. In the, and, and, and the abundance that he wants to bring into life looks different for different people. We see that even through scripture. It wasn't the same level of abundance for Paul as it was for Peter or for John or for the other disciples. Or ever. It's different. Abundance looks different for each and every one of us. And abundance is so much more than just some numbers and some digits in your bank account. Abundance is the relationships that you and I have. It's the time that we have. It's the talents that he's given us. It's the open doors and the connections that he's given us. All these things, this abundance that he wants to give us is absolutely necessary if we're going to be effective in doing what he's called us to do. You following me? For us to be effective in seeing the kingdom of God advance, effective in preaching the gospel, there needs to be the reality of abundance in your life and in my life. Otherwise, there, wherever we go, there we are again. And all we do is we end up bringing people into the same bondage and captivity that we find ourselves in. But the, the goal is to bring them into the freedom of Jesus Christ. Amen? And the thing about lordship is it's not the same for each person. Um, so turn with me to, Ma to Matthew. Matthew 19. I'm going to read the one story and mention two other stories, Matthew 19, and we're going to spend a bit of time Matthew 19. And then just a pre-warning, I'm looking for, four, for five volunteers, five volunteers. So start to think in your mind and if, you, if you're one of my volunteers, Bill, are you a volunteer? So you look away there, so I was just wondering, you know. <laughs> Matthew 19. Verse 16 says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Um, he's buttering up the Lord because he's, he's trying to, he wants to show the Lord how, how good he is, how well he's performing in life. He's doing so well, so good. It's like, good teacher, what shall I do to, uh, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Just kind of put him in his place right there. And then he said, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And another translation actually says, or another, one of the other books, uh, one of the other gospels says, and loving him, Jesus turned to him and loved him. Loving him, he said this. Jesus will always speak into your life and my life. It's an issue of lordship because he loves us. He, if he is Lord in that area of our lives, we will see victory, we'll see breakthrough, and we'll see abundance. And he will always speak, he'll always deal with the thing that is keeping us from accepting his lordship in that area of our lives. Does that make sense? So Jesus says to him, if you want to be perfect, because he could tell this guy wants to be perfect. He's been keeping all these commandments, doing all these things, getting it all right, dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's. If you want to be perfect... Go, sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. 24, and again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And another place it says, for a rich man who trusts in his riches. So what's the story? What's going on here with this, the, with, with this young ruler? Before I mention anything more, let me mention Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus, short little Zacchaeus? And he stood in a tree, well, see, he climbed a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus came, stopped and said, today I'm going to eat at your house. Did Jesus tell him to go and sell all this stuff? No, he didn't. You see, for each and every single one of us, 
there is something different that he, that he wants to do in your life and in my life so that he, we can accept his lordship in our lives. For Zacchaeus, when he had a revelation of who Jesus was, he gave away a whole bunch of stuff that he had got through fraudulent, fraudulent um, uh, means. And he gave stuff away. He gave, he gave away more than he had taken. But Jesus didn't come and say, you need to give all your stuff away. Jesus came and ate with him. Think about Mary and Martha and, and, and Lazarus. This is a family that Jesus loved. He spent much time with them, uh, two sisters and a brother. Um, they say that they were a wealthier family. Maybe they were kind of middle to upper class kind of wealthy family. They were always entertaining people. They had people in their home. When Lazarus dies, there's a whole bunch of people there busy um, mourning and, 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 and doing their thing because Lazarus is now dead. And he'd been placed in a tomb. So he had, they, had, they had means available to them in their lives because you, you, he wasn't a pauper. They was put in a pauper's grave. He was put in a tomb. If you put in a tomb, you were doing pretty well. And Jesus went into that tomb and he raised Lazarus from the dead. But with Martha and Mary and Lazarus, you don't see Jesus saying, give away everything you have. He says it to the rich young ruler because for that rich young ruler, everything he had was his idol. That was his Lord. That was his God. And Jesus, wants, Jesus is a jealous God. He wants to be Lord. And if we find ourselves a little bit of trust in him and a little bit of trust in material possessions or a little bit of trust in the degree you have or a little bit of trust in how good you are with people and your communication skills, in your friendliness, in your job, whatever it may be, your talent, a little bit of trust in that thing. He's going to come and he's going to deal with that thing so that he is Lord in our lives. Does that make sense? He deals with Martha and Mary and Lazarus differently to the way he deals with this rich young ruler, differently to the way he deals with Zacchaeus, differently to the way he deals with you and with me. And with all of us, that the point is not one size fits all. The point is, is he Lord? Do we trust him? Is our trust in him, not in our, I'm keeping all, I'm doing all the good things. I've got all this money and uh, my trust is in the money. Is, where, where, where is our trust? Is it in, is it in him? So Peter then says, he says, when his disciples, verse 25, when his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? Great, that's a great response right there. You know, if a rich, if it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, which um, seems to be a place that was in Jerusalem where there was like this little gate where the camels had to go through and they had to take all the stuff off the camels to fit the camel through the gate, apparently. Whatever. We just know it was very hard for that camel to go through that place. And for it was, it's easier for a camel to go through there than for a rich person to, who puts their trust in riches to come into the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples hear that and they go, well, there's no hope for us then. Which at least, at least then they had some kind of revelation of humility of like, well, you know, we're not, we're not rich, we're okay. They actually recognized in that moment, like, who can be saved? Like, this is, if that's true for that person, it must be true for me too. It must be true for those around us. Who can be saved? They were astonished. And then Jesus tells him, well, then he says this. He says, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And so Peter answers and says to him, but see, we have left all and we have followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Anyone asked the Lord that question before? God, I've given so much. I've done this. I've left that thing. I'd said no to that, whatever it was I was going to go and do, or no to that thing. When, and it just made complete sense that for me to do that. But I said no to that because of what you have said to me and your call on my life. What now? It's okay to ask that question. It's all right to ask that question. God, I've done this. I've, that's happened. That's happened. What now? It's good to ask that question. Just ask it from a place of humility, not from a place, not, not from the rich young ruler's perspective of, I've done all these things, God. You following me? Peter's like, we, we, we've left everything. Uh, we see which, how you handled that guy. We recognize that with God, with God, all things are possible. Okay, thank, we hear that. Um, but we've left everything. So what is available to us? Great question to ask. And Jesus says this. He says, assuredly, I say to you, uh, he says, surely I say to you, in the regeneration where the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now you might say, well, that's very specific to those 12 disciples. Yes, but listen to the next verse. And everyone, anyone in this room that's part of the everyone? If you, every, everyone's here. Okay, good. Nadia said, yeah, 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 four times. So she took four of them. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be lost, and the last first. 
What does Jesus say here? He's saying all that stuff, telling the rich young ruler, all that stuff, all that, that stuff, it's going to kill you. Then he tells his disciples, all that stuff that's going to kill you, I'm going to give you a hundred times as much. Did you see that in the story? He tells the rich young ruler, give everything away. Come follow me. That, stuff, that stuff's going to kill you. You're not going to inherit eternal life with that stuff. Get, 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 give it away. That stuff will kill you. So Peter says, well, we've given everything away. We've left everything to follow you, Lord. Lord is the key word there. To follow you, Lord. We've left everything. And Jesus says, well, all that stuff that was going to kill you, I'm going to give you a hundred times as much. Isn't that amazing? You see, what happens is it's not about how much or how little. It has everything to do with our hearts. Is he Lord of our lives? Is he Lord? Is he Lord? Can we, when, when, when he is Lord, we can handle the hundred times of the stuff that would have killed us on the other side. But it won't kill us now because we can handle it because he is Lord. And I think there's still too many Christians saying, well, God, give me all the stuff to handle and then watch and see. And God's like, I'm watching and seeing. I can't give it to you yet. I'm watching and seeing. I can't give it to you yet. I'm waiting for you to be faithful with the one. I'm waiting for you to be faithful with the two. Waiting for you to be faithful with the five so that I can see that this is somebody that I can entrust because at the end of the day, it's a stewardship thing. He is Lord. I get to steward. It all belongs to him. I get to steward it. Amen? So it's not the same requirement for each and every one of us. There are different things. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not some special formula. It's an issue of lordship. Amen? The kingdom of God is within us. It's heart issues. It's what's going on on the inside of us. Are you and I willing to yield completely to the one who is absolutely Lord? All right, you ready for one more story? Matthew, stay in Matthew 19, verse 30. It says, but many who are first will be lost and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his field. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, before we carry on reading the story, I want to just point out this story is a continuation of what Jesus has just been talking about. He's been dealing with the rich young ruler. He's then told his disciples they've left everything. Now they're going to follow him. Another translation says you'll receive farms and, and families and all these things and persecution. I think it's in... Um, I actually jotted it down here. Mark 10. Mark 10 says, um, and, and, and persecution. It's like, it's like all these things. That's, the, that's the, 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 the goodness of God, the, the grace of God, and all that kind of stuff. And then the and persecution, that's the tax on all these things that he gives us. Which is just a reminder. That was a joke for three of you who maybe caught that. Just a reminder that this is about this life, not the life to come. There's no persecution in the life to come. Jesus was saying all this to his disciples, that this is true of this life. If you've left everything, I'll be able to entrust you with everything. And there'll be persecution also because we live in this world. And there is per it's a fact of life, persecution. Amen? The tax on the goodness of God. So, talking about them leaving everything, them gaining everything, he then says, verse 30 of, of, verse, of chapter 19, he says, many who are first will be last and the last first. And then he launches into the story. And this is a continuation as we start to learn, to, as we start to understand a little bit of our hearts um, in this. So I need, I need five volunteers. I need five volunteers. Five. I need uh, maybe a couple of guys, a couple of ladies, just five volunteers. Just five volunteers. Shirley, thank you. Shirley, you're not going to really sit for the rest of the message, so get comfortable in the front here. Yeah? Shante, come. Um, okay, no, you guys have my wife. Go, go sit down. Um, trying to see who's the most uncomfortable. Uh, Zim, Zimkita, you, is your... Oh, okay. No. Um, oh, do you want to come? Yeah, we'll see. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, fantastic. That's, is that five? That's five. Awesome. So all of you go on this side over here. Okay. All right, so... Um, Let's start with Shirley. So, okay, so, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers, so Shirley, come, I've got this vineyard. I need it to get tended to for the day. It's um, 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I would like to make an agreement with you for the day to come and work in my vineyard. Um, would you be willing to do that? 
Would you be willing to work in my vineyard for 200 rand for the day? Okay, fantastic. Could you please go over somewhere over the end over there and begin to work in the vineyard? Hope you got your sunscreen. Don't drink the wine. Just work in the vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the, the, the laborers for a den- denarius a day, so we're not going to use a denarius, we're going to use 200 rand. Does that sound fine? Okay. Denarius a day. He sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Oh, there's these idle people here. So, so Vusi, I see you standing around. Um, and uh, you also, would you like to go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. Would you work in my vineyard? Thank you so much, Vusi. Would you just go over there and begin to help Shirley um, just watch that she's not stealing my produce? Um, and uh, so it goes on, it says, and again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour did li- likewise. So, okay, so Constance, um, can you do, would you like to come work in my vineyard? This is like, it's about midday now, so would you come stand over there and work in my vineyard? And then Shante, um, uh, would you like to work in my vineyard? Fantastic. You can actually just stay right where you are, actually right there, and Owen will move you down that end. Um, so before we get to Owen, let's just read the rest of the story. So... Um, Uh, About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? Why have you been standing here idle all day? (laughs) So this is the part where you say, I had no work. I had no work. Excellent. He's brilliant, right? So he had no work. So would you like to come work in my vineyard? There's about an hour left of the day. I would like to hire you. Okay, fantastic. Can you stand over there and go work on those branches over there? That'll be great. Okay, so now we've got five people. Working, well, Shantae, you need to be here. Okay, that's fine. The table's good. I know. The the table's fine. You can work at the table. So they're all working in the vineyard. Different, Shirley started in the morning. So she's been working for like eight, nine, ten hours, however long it is. She's working really, really hard. We worked our way through. Vusi's working there. Constance is busy working. Shantae is working. Owen is working. And, um, but Owen's only really just started. And then it says, and they said to him, wait, wait, let's just go to verse eight. So when evening had come, The owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. Now, the story about being the last being first, this is not about like, well, if you stand in the back of the queue, you get to the front of the queue and all that. And, you know, we we should all be last and we should all be first. There are other places in the Bible that deal with that principle. This is not that principle. This is something completely different. This is the landowner. This is Jesus the king testing your heart and my heart in how he handles people around us. Because how many of you know that when you're in need and you need something, suddenly your friend has the thing you needed? Has that ever happened to anybody? You're like, okay, so we're going to get to that, right? So the day has come to the end. Owen has barely broken a sweat. Owen, would you come over here? Um, and uh, all, could you all come, all just come and gather nearby because you need to all see they're getting paid. And remember, Shirley's been working all day. She is, she is done. She's been working really, really hard. And um, so I've got the wages here. And um, so, so, Owen, so what, how much did we agree on at the beginning of the day? 200. Okay. So how much did we agree on? We didn't agree. We didn't agree. I just said I'd pay you what was right, right? So we agreed on 200 at the beginning of the day. So, Owen, thank you for working for one hour in my vineyard. Here's 200 grand for you. Thank you. You're welcome to go and take a seat. Shantae, how many hours did you work for? Like maybe three. I think you maybe worked for about three hours. Yeah, maybe three, four hours. But here's 200 grand for you. Thank you for, for working in my vineyard today. Thank you. Anyone else wishing they were volunteers today? <laughs> Constance, you worked for about five, six hours or so. Thank you so much for working so hard in my vineyard today. Here's 200 rand for you. Wonderful. This is also 200. I just ran out of 100 rand notes. So, um, uh, Vusi, you worked for probably uh, nine hours, seven, eight, nine hours or so. You've worked really, really hard today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Here's 200 rand for you. So as Shirley comes to the front, comes up here, it says, when, and when, when those who came here were hired about the 11th hour, they each received 200 rand. Okay? And when the first came, they supposed they would receive more, and they likewise also received 200 rand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you so much, Shirley, for working in my vineyard today. You've worked really, really hard. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. 
You got something you want to say? Is there something you want to say? When they'd received it, they complained against the landowner. It looks like she's, she gets on Facebook, on Facebook, on Instagram, starts to talk about that business and say that's a terrible business, shocking business. They just terrible people, treat people so badly. It says, and when they received it, they complained. It's saying, these last men or ladies have worked only one hour and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Friend, have I done you any wrong? It sure feels like it, right? But I've done you no wrong because we agreed at the beginning of the day. Don't nod and your spiritual now. You're still upset. Don't, 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 don't be a pull of Shirley now. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This. You're upset. You're upset. You, you've been paid the same amount as everybody else. But it's what we agreed to. We agreed to 200 Rand at the beginning of the day. And then he goes on to say, he says, but he answered one of them and said, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for 200 Rand? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last one the same as to you. This is how the kingdom of God works. This has got nothing to do with when you do good to somebody, when you help somebody cross the road, when you give someone a cold, uh, a cup of water, whatever. Everything that you and I have ever done for the name of Jesus Christ will be rewarded. This has got everything to do with our sense of justice on the inside of us. Where God chooses to bless somebody else. You see, we will always be given just wages or there will be extreme grace. Shirley got just wages. She worked all day. She got paid exactly what we agreed on. Just wait. She did, I, didn't pay, I didn't shortchange her as the landowner. She wasn't shortchanged. She was paid what, she, what was agreed on. But for the person coming at the end, who was the, at the end? Owen, who, worked, who barely broke a sweat. For him, it's extreme grace. There will always be just wages for every single one of us in our lives. As we follow Jesus, everything that you do will be rewarded. But God will test your heart and test my heart because are we able to steward the abundance he gives us when he blesses somebody else and doesn't bless us? Are we able to handle it? If the verse goes on, he says, he says, take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Is your eye evil because I'm good. You see, what the Holy Spirit is doing even today as I'm sharing this story and just help hoping, to help, hoping this help to bring it to life a little bit is it's pushing all our bus buttons on justice. Um, but I do so much. I work so hard. I've, I've borne the brunt of the, of the burden. I've, 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 done, I've done what you've told me to do, Lord, but I see how you're blessing that person. I see the extreme grace going to that person. And what God is looking for with all of us is do we understand that it all belongs to him? And he's able to do with his stuff whatever he wants to do with his stuff. And are we able to step into a place of gratitude, a place of thankfulness, and a place of where we're able to celebrate the extreme grace on someone else's life, even in our time of need? That's what lordship is all about. If he is truly Lord, we will be able to celebrate the extreme grace that is aimed at another person, even when I'm going through the struggle and I need that breakthrough. You might have heard the testimony this morning of somebody's debt that got reduced. And you're saying, I desperately need my debt to be reduced. Why didn't you do that to me, Lord? And I'm hoping that off the back of this message today, our response will change. And we will say, God, I celebrate what you did for that person. I am so grateful for what you did for that person. Thank you, Jesus, for coming through for that person. And not do that in a way that goes, well, if I say all of that, then... Because then we're becoming like the rich young ruler again. I've done, I've dotted my I's and crossed my T's and done all my stuff. Uh, what, what have you got for me? He knows what's going on inside of our hearts. And remember, abundance is a, is a heart issue. It starts here, prosperity of soul. It's, like, it's a lordship thing on the inside of us. Are we able to, when we see someone being blessed, celebrated, grace on their lives, abundance in their lives, are we able to deal with the issue of jealousy? Deal with the issue of why not me? Deal with all those things so that we can rejoice in somebody else's breakthrough. 
when they weren't treated justly, it's like, well, they didn't deserve that. I've been working harder than they have. They weren't treated justly. They were treated with extreme grace. That's the God we serve. And I do believe that if all of us in this room can learn that principle, and boy, this, this, it's a hard one to learn. It is a hard one to learn. But we can learn that, and we can begin to celebrate others. I've watched it happen with people when, when things happen and, and doors open and people get things, and they're like, oh, what? oh, you're doing well. And then what's going on in your mind is it's not so much about you doing well. It's actually like, how did you deserve that? <laughs> Am I making sense? And we've got to get to that place where we have completely dealt with the jealousy issue. Completely dealt with this, is your eye evil because I am good? Dealt with the evil eye where we see things and go, why is that? Why don't I have that? Why is that not me? Why don't I have that? Why don't I have that? Why don't I? Why? Don't, why? 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 And we deal with what our eye is seeing to the point where we see him and we see his grace in other people's lives. And we recognize that, hey, if I have sweated it out all day and I got my 200 rand, I'm thankful to my Lord for my 200 rand because I got what I worked for. But I know that there will be a day, if I understand that principle, he is an incredibly good father who will always give me, he will always reward me for my work. We've talked about reward for, for we talk about reward all the time. He, he will always reward me, but there will be a moment of extreme grace. And I believe extreme grace moments will come to every single one of us if we've dealt with this issue in our lives. Amen? Verse 16. So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. For me, this thing about being called and being chosen is not about being right now in this moment. This is, this is dealing with money. It's dealing with finances. It's dealing with possessions. It's, it's dealing with leaving everything to follow him. He is calling you and me in into a place where we can handle them more. And he wants to choose us if we pass the test. This is the test of the one talent. This is the test of the two talents. This is the test of the five talents. Will you pass the test so that I can, so I can choose you? He says to the guy at the ten talents, he says, uh, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you in charge of ten cities. He chose him. He called him at the beginning. He passed the test. Then he chose him to look after ten cities. Does that make sense? God wants to choose us in this room today. Say, so I, I find you faithful. I, I, I see your heart. I see you have left everything to follow me. I will give you farms and this and that and the next thing. And persecution because we live on this earth. But it's a lordship issue. Does that help us today? Make sense? I'm going to ask the worship team to come and jump up on the stage. God is looking for people that he can entrust a hundred times as much to this morning if I can endure your blessing or if I can celebrate your blessing when I desperately needed that blessing then I will be able to handle the hundred times as much and the persecution that comes with it you know what because one of the issues is can you handle the persecution that comes with abundance how many of you know there's persecution that comes with abundance? Jesus said it, and we know it, we know it to be true. We see it to be true. If we can handle, if we can celebrate somebody else's blessing when we desperately needed it, then we'll be able to handle the persecution, the challenge, the pressure, all of that that comes with the hundred times as much that he wants to give us. Amen? It's about lordship. And if he is Lord, then we are stewards. And we can steward the abundance he gives us. I would like to read Psalm 23. Nadia spoke about Psalm 23. And so we're going to sing that song. But I want to read Psalm 23 to end today. And let me, let's, maybe we can all stand. Let's stand as we, as we do that. Then we're going to end by singing this song. And then when we finish singing, I would like to us to have an opportunity today to pray for people. I'd like us to pray for people. If anything that has been spoken about in this message today has struck a chord on the inside. And you need someone to pray with you today. We're gonna, I'm going to ask maybe some guys can just move these tables out the way. I do believe some people need to respond this morning. Say, Lord, I've, I've been jealous. Or I've been bitter towards you because I've been receiving just wages, but I, I've, I haven't seen the blessing. I haven't seen the blessing. And God wants to deal with that in our lives today. It's a lordship issue. So we can all step out of this place today with a prosperous soul. Amen. Psalm 23 says this. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Again, don't miss the first two words. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That psalm is true because the psalmist knew, David was writing this, he knew it's the Lord. He's my shepherd. Therefore the rest is true. The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore the rest is true. So Father, I pray for us in this room today that all of us will know you as Lord.